So here's the question. Why is there so much poverty in America uh, today? In your neighborhood, my neighborhood, in the communities in which we live, why do we drive by it, you know, roll up the window, or think that we're doing something when we give out a little bit of pocket change or buy someone uh, a Happy Meal? Uh, my guest today, Matthew Desmond, uh, wrote a book because he needed an answer to those questions. And despite being the most prosperous democracy in the world, we have by almost every measure, uh, the worst poverty in the world. More than 38 million of our fellow Americans cannot afford their basic necessities, home, food, clothing. So why does this land of plenty allow one in eight of its children to go without those basic necessities, permitting scores of its citizens to live and quite frankly die uh, on the streets? And at the same time, I guess, authorize its corporations to pay poverty wages. Matthew Desmond is a social scientist, um, an urban ethnogra ethnographer, uh, uh, and professor of, so of sociology, as well as the director of the eviction lab at Princeton University. His research and reporting on American poverty and public policy earned him the MacArthur Fellowship, uh, and his 2016 book, Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City won the Pulitzer Prize for general, general notification nonfiction. Uh, he is here today. We're going to talk about that and his new work, Poverty by America, uh, which is out now. Uh, and we're going to get into those questions and a whole lot more coming up next on the Michael Steele podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to our conversation. I'm really excited uh, to have uh, Matt here with us to talk about um, the work that he's been doing in an area that given all the politics and the, everything else going on, um, we kind of, I think, lose sight of from time to time is how people are trying to make their lives and their ends meet, um, how as a nation we're dealing with one of the most pervasive problems um, that we have in poverty. Um, and Matthew, and Matt, Matthew, you've done a lot of work in this area. And I, I'm really, really uh, glad to welcome you to the conversation, man. Oh, it's great to be here, Michael. Thanks so much for, for having me. So so in, in uh, your book, um, you write, we accept the current state of affairs, all right? Um, we like it. And I say that a lot about uh, where we are in politics. As much as everybody wrings their hands and complains and moans about it, they like the drama. They like the exhilaration from it. But when it comes to poverty, that's a whole different kind of conversation. Um, what is it that we accept about the, this current state of affairs with respect to the poor in this country? What is it we like and who is we? <laughs> Yeah, right. I think we have to face the cold, hard fact that a lot of us profit from poverty. You know, we consume the cheap goods and services that the working poor produce. Uh, many of us are invested in the stock market. And mm -hmm. when our savings go up, often that goes up because some wages are kept low. And those those profits come at a human sacrifice. Right. Um, you know, many of us protect tax breaks that are, are accrued to the top 20% of Americans. And if we didn't have so much poverty and eviction and homelessness, maybe we can live with that state of affairs. But currently, we do a lot more to guard fortunes than to fight poverty. And then many of us continue to be segregationist. We draw walls around our communities and hoard opportunity behind those walls. And who is the we? You know, I think that we always want the we to be the guy right above us on the right. and the, and the cloud. Right. Yeah. That, that guy that, oh, that's, you know, I, I might be comfortable, but that guy's really comfortable. And so I, I think the we is is a lot of us, those who have found some economic security and privilege in this country. Yeah, it, for me, it just, um, it really, it really 
begs a lot of different questions that some answers are, are harder to, to answer than some others. But the fact that we don't even seemingly have the conversation, Matt, is where I, I kind of begin in this. I spent uh, a lot of my formative years um, and certainly at one point was on a direction of, of you know, becoming a priest and living my life of poverty, mm. chastity, and obedience, um, such as it were, and, and working with and 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 living um, uh, in communities of the poor to try to improve life. Um, while I I chose a different course, I still carry out that work as a, do a lot of people through Catholic charities and other organizations that I'm affiliated with, trying to figure out how we fix the problem. Certainly, was an issue when I was lieutenant governor, looking at. Uh, more directly the the causal relationship between your paycheck and your lack of opportunity and um, why why this school district looks worse off than the one right next to it. And you touch on a lot of these um, uh, different factors and areas uh, that sort of drive the the engine of poverty. what What are some of those that you see that are, are most pernicious in, uh, not helping us move the needle on this subject. A big one is exploitation. And a lot of us don't like that word, but it just kind of comes down to choice. You know, when our choice is really constricted, we often find ourselves in a bad position and taken advantage of for that. You know, there used to be a time when the job market delivered for a lot of Americans, you know, folks that had a college degree and folks that didn't. But as workers have lost power over the years, companies have gained it. And for a lot of folks, wages have stagnated. You know, for, for folks without a high school diploma, workers, they got paid less in 2017, 10% less than they would have in 1979, adjusting for inflation. That's a bad situation. And there's exploitation going on in the housing market and the financial markets as well that we really need to, to confront. Well, so so the the housing market uh, is is an interesting uh, creature simply because of, and again, you you talk about race and the role that it plays, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but you know the redlining of areas, um, and then suddenly the decision, oh, we're going to invest in this area, then pushing the poor out um, into right. some other part because developers and others have decided that now is the time to make an investment in this community, but we're not gonna make that investment as long as the poor are here. What is that mindset? What does that tell you? I guess even where does it come from? Because I would think that if I've got a community that is that is on hard rocks at the moment and they need a Starbucks and um, a local mart or, you know, hey, let's let's invest in the dry cleaner and the, and the grocery store that's already there, to sort of encourage and incentivize the community to take whatever little bit they do have and and keep it in that community, number one, but then that feeds the the job engine and that feeds the the home valuation engine, et cetera. What what is the problem with that strategy? That it doesn't seem to be something that the government, developers, and even some communities are, are willing to invest in. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like we're giving a stage four cancer patient a couple Tylenol and we're wondering why nothing's working. <laughs> hey, and right. a lot of times, you know, we know what works. We can make these deeper investments and we can afford to make them deeper without increasing the deficit. But a lot of times we just hold back uh, programs that, that are necessary. So if you focus on the housing market, right, you talked about the legacy of, of racism in there. And that's a huge part of the story, right? Most Black Americans now are renters. Most uh, Hispanic American families are renters, but most mm -hmm. white families are homeowners. And so, and they get entitlements that renters don't, right? They get things like the mortgage interest deduction. Whereas if you're a poor renting family, you basically have one choice about where to live. You can't live in public housing or get any kind of assistance because the waiting list for those programs often stretch into the years, even the decades, you know, decades long waiting list for public mm -hmm. health. And then you're shut out of home ownership, not because you can't afford, afford a mortgage, but because banks aren't interested in doing business with you. And so you're stuck. And so when you're stuck, you're exploited and exploitable. 
And so most poor renting families now spend over half of their income on, on housing costs. This is a broken system. And it's hard for those of us that are homeowners to really wrap our heads around how damaging and brutal the rental market is. Because for us, housing really works, right? Our rents don't go up. We pay the same amount. For many of us, our home is a wealth builder. But for a third of the country, the housing market just is failing them in really significant ways. So how do these how do these systems that we have in place and 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 this is I think one of the you know correct me if I'm wrong one of the central uh, themes or or pushes in your latest book Poverty by America is this this idea that you have these government programs right that I guess on paper they were they're supposed to work mm-hmm. but in reality they actually exacerbate or make the problem worse. I mean, you, you talk about the, the for example, the ways in which government resources have been misused or underutilized. Um, you talk about the Clinton era welfare program called Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. In 2020, poor families received just 22 cents in every dollar it dispersed. The rest of us, the rest was used by states to pay for such things as job training, even abstinence, only sex education. Right. Okay. So how does putting the bulk of those resources into abstinence programs, sexual uh, behavior programs versus food deserts and programs where, you know, people are trying to make rent or whatever. I mean, what, what is the disconnect between the government programming and the people they're supposed to help. It's a huge disconnect. And I, I want to be clear, there's so many government programs that are lifesavers to low-income families. Sure. Right? There are government programs that are really saving millions of folks from homelessness and hunger every year. But you're right. There are these massive inefficiencies also built into our system. And so states now have a lot of leeway about how to spend those welfare dollars. And there's only one state, Kentucky, that spends most of the welfare dollars and dollars in hand to low-income families. And look, this is kind of a policy conversation, but what we're talking about, right, is the poorest kids in America not getting enough because states aren't deeply investing in their families. It's not just a red state or a blue state issue. Right. You know, Tennessee is sitting on $700 million in unspent welfare funds, but Hawaii is sitting on enough that they could give every poor kid in their state $10,000. So this is really a nationwide problem. And it suggests that a low hanging fruit here is just make sure that the programs that we already have on the books are working to maximum capacity. So we've just come on the other side of uh, a global pandemic. And we we know, uh, in addition to the horror stories that resulted in the loss of life, there are also very difficult stories regarding how people are surviving or trying to survive post COVID. Um, what, what, I guess, how did the pandemic in the first instance um, highlight and, and put a real spotlight on the eviction issues and the mm-hmm. poverty issues uh, that we're, that we're now having to confront? I think there were several lessons out of the pandemic. One is, you know, America was unique among advanced democracies to have an eviction crisis immediately when COVID hit, right? It's not like France and Germany suddenly had an eviction crisis. That was us. And that should signal how fragile life is for so many tenants below the poverty line. And so uh, the government stepped up, right? It passed an eviction moratorium that lasted almost a year. That moratorium was passed under the Trump administration and then lasted into the Biden administration. Studies have shown that that decreased uh, deaths by 11%, saved tens of thousands of lives. Right. And then the government rolled out emergency rental assistance, which was just basically a big chunk of money, $46.5 billion directed at tenants who had fallen behind in Mm -hmm. COVID and dropped the eviction rate to the lowest ever on record. And it stayed that way for months and months and months after the moratorium left. What's the lesson here? One of the lessons is, man, government programs, when they flex, when they're bold, uh, can make a giant difference in the lives of the most vulnerable families in America. Look at the child tax credit, right? Which is 
just basically a, a check that was mailed out to middle and low income families. Right. Cut child poverty by 46% in six months. Six yeah, but that in, but that program is being phased out now. And, done. And, yeah. Yeah. So so when so when you hear that, going back to again how government looks like it tends to get in its own way in solving some of these issues. What does that say? What what does next year and the next three, five years look like since we saw it work? Yeah. And the government seemingly was okay with writing that check. Yeah. And pulling 40 million kids off the poverty uh, rolls. What does that look like now? Congress should have been terrified to take those benefits away from us. You know, they should have been incredibly scared of the voter response. But the movement wasn't there. We weren't loud enough. You know, we should have been demanding that this become the new normal. And what happened was predictably, right, you had the same old kind of concerns about cost of the program right? and how much this would cost. And look, costs are important, but let's just focus on a single study that came out a few years ago that showed that if the top 1% just paid the taxes they owed, not paid more taxes, just stopped evading taxes, Right. Uh, we could raise an additional $175 billion a year. That's more than enough to reinstate the child tax credit. You know, that's enough to double our investment in affordable housing. That's almost enough to pull everyone below the poverty line out of poverty. So I think that we have to resist that scarcity mindset and realize that the country can do big things without you know, driving up the deficit. De deficit. Yeah. So Matt, why, why didn't we say anything? Why why didn't the country, I mean, the actual people who saw and received the benefit say yeah. something. There yeah. was no, there's no, been no hue and cry from the masses, whether they are in poverty or not, whether they are wealthy or not. I mean, there've been, people have just basically been fixated on the latest you know, drama either on TV, sports, or, you know, the reality TV we call politics. And yet these these seemingly life affirming or life threatening moments, they just they just don't seem to have anything to say. It's like the gun issue. You know, we have the another mass shooting and and six people die and everybody does thoughts and prayers and just kind of sits back and waits for the next next newscast telling us, hey, guess it's happened again. So yeah. wh what is it that you found in your research and in the work that you've done in this space, um, going all the way back to your, your book in 2016, Evicted, uh, where you talked about that, you know, the, the poverty and profit motives that, that, are, that are driven a lot of, uh, you know, American cities. What, what is it about the American people that we don't seem to get exercised about the fact that 40 million kids are now going to be put back into poverty. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough question. I think that, um, you know, there were these beautiful, uh, TikTok videos and, um, expressions of, of relief for families that benefited from these programs during COVID, you know, it was right. really wonderful to watch, uh, families just, uh, express gratitude and and breathe a, a little bit. But you're right. You know, I think that we have as a country been so, I mean, we've, we're sliding back to normal. We're sliding back to a place where evictions are, are commonplace. We're sliding back to a place where one in nine of us, you know, can't afford basic necessities. And I think that those of us who are searching and longing for a better world are often very fluent in the language of critique, mm -hmm. but kind of bumbling in the language of repair. You know, we know how to point a figure and say, not that. That's right. Bad. Right. We, we, we're we developing, we need to develop a better language of saying, man, I, I want to live in a world where there's half of many evictions as there were last year. I want to live in that world. I want to live in a world where, you know, we keep cutting child poverty. Let's try to get that thing to zero. So I, I think we need to to really develop that capacity and that that you know that imagination that word of promise. All right, we're going to take a, a quick break because uh, when we come back, I want to pick up on that point to talk about what that language sounds like. Yeah. What are the words we should be thinking about using, um, and, and sort of connect your earlier work 
um, evicted with your latest work, poverty, um, and and see and see whether we can figure out what that <laughs> what that that language is. We're we're having a great conversation with Matt De Matthew Desmond. He is a social scientist and director of the Eviction Lab at Princeton University. Uh, a whole lot more with Matt right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele podcast. Uh, we're trying to do a, a, a deep dive um, into uh, the issues and questions around poverty in, in, in America and why, especially in this post-COVID uh, period where we've seen the emasculation and elimination of a program that moved 40 million children out of, out of poverty, um, where seemingly people just kind of going along, you know, as we were uh, before without much uh, noise around this issue. Well, there is someone who's making a noise and writing about strategies in which we as citizens can begin to uh, change and reform the system. And that is Matthew Desmond, uh, who's joined us. Uh, Matthew, I, I want to pick up on your last point before the break about um, the language that we should be looking to employ to change this conversation so that we can better engage in solving the problem, maybe even put it out there, get better at electing people who actually give a damn about the problem. Um, mm. I think that kind of feeds into the beast too. I know on my side, the first thing anybody starts cr screaming and crying about, um, you know, when you talk about various solutions is, oh, it costs too much. Mm -hmm. And when I hear that from representatives in places like Mississippi, the poorest state in the country, Appalachia, West Virginia, uh, Alabama, and other places, especially in the South, which is riven with poverty, even though seemingly they act like it doesn't exist there. Um, at some point, we've got to begin to move this needle. What should we be saying? How should we be talking about this? And what are some of the strategies you think we can start to employ like 10 minutes from now? <laughs> yeah, I think we need to commit ourselves to becoming poverty abolitionists. And we can do that 10 minutes from now, you know? Right. And we can say, look, poverty isn't just a minor social issue. It's not something we have to live with. It's an abomination. The richest country in the world shouldn't have to put up with it. And I think we see and share with other abolitionist movements the conviction that profiting from someone else's pain drags us all down, diminishes us all. And so poverty abolitionism is a different way of talking about poverty. You know, it's a mm. different way of shopping. It's a different way of investing. It's a different way of thinking about our taxes and our benefits in our, in our neighborhoods. So a poverty abolitionist during tax season might Instead of complaining about the big old tax bill, you got to write, you know, right in April, say, you know, I'm getting these tax breaks for my mortgage, for my kids college savings. And man, it, it makes me uncomfortable that the country is spending so much more on those than they are to fight poverty. I'm going to I'm going to write my my congressperson about this. You know, that's a step. You know, when we're talking about neighborhoods and opening up these neighborhoods for promise, that's not just talk. That means going down to your zoning board meeting, you know, Tuesday night and standing up and saying, look, I, I refuse to borrow their kids from the opportunity my kids have living in this, this place. Let's build this thing. And so I think that poverty abolitionism is kind of, you know, this moral ambition. And we used to have that moral ambition as a country, right? When yeah. we launched the war on poverty in 64, Johnson wasn't playing. They set a deadline. You know, and I'd love us to kind of reach back to that sense of moral urgency and ambition. That to me is very American. So how, okay, so that's a very interesting point you just made about the Johnson administration in 64, the war on poverty. Tag that for us a little bit, sort of give us sort of the, the, the historical outcome from those efforts and relate it to what's happened since then. Because I think we can make the case that it is, it's all been downhill since then. Hmm. Uh, and not not in a not a, and not in a good way. No, yeah. So I mean, one place to start is by recognizing that in the '60s, Congress was a mess. You know, the Dixiecrats were aligning. <laughs> more of a mess than it is today. <laughs> it was a mess. You know, senators were sleeping in their offices, filibustering reform. Right? It yeah. was incredibly divided. 
the country was anti-democratic in fact, you know, by by barring African Americans from the voting booth. Right. And so I think that, you know, in that in that cauldron, major passes of civil rights legislation was passed and the war on poverty and great society were passed. And why? And I think there's pretty convincing historical evidence that the labor movement and the civil rights movement just forced Congress's hand. And I think that should give us hope. And I think that, you know, we've been here before and I hope lies in in the movements. The war on poverty and the great society were uh, did things like make food aid permanent, expand Medicaid, expand Social Security. Right. I mean, it's you know, it's hard for us to imagine. But, you know, several generations ago, so many elderly Americans were just dying penniless. Um, and just these massive investments in the poorest families. And if you compare the poverty line in 1970 to 1960, it was basically cut in half. You know, the war on poverty and great society really drove down uh, the poverty line, um, and particularly for African-American families and particularly for kids, too. So I'm not I'm not one who generally likes to do the 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 European comparison thing, you know, because our system is fundamentally different than right. the European models, particularly when it comes to the economic piece. But I presume, not presume, but I, I, I'm aware of and know that there are some examples and some measures in this area that we could learn from. Um, how how are other countries addressing poverty um, in their in their communities, um, and what can we potentially learn from them? Not that there's a one for one correlation by by any stretch, sir. By just cool your jets on that. Mm -hmm. But the the reality of it is there, you know, we're never too big or too smart to learn. Right. And there are some good examples. Could you share a few of them? Sure. You know, uh, simply put, a lot of other countries invest a higher percentage of their GDP in social programs. You know, so if you look at uh, Germany, for example, there's just a deeper investment in social housing right. than there is here. And that's something that journalists live in, teachers live in, firefighters live in, the poorest folks in Germany live in. It's not stigmatized and it's integrated and it, and it works. Um, there are programs in Canada that establish just the, the right to housing, for example. Um, I, I think that just in the nitty gritty of things, you know, it's the bigger picture is kind of like they collect a bit more taxes and they invest that in their people. And that is a bargain that I could totally live with. Um, and so to me, the hard part isn't knowing what to do or how to pay for it. The hard part is building a political will. And this is what the movements are doing now. And this is what I hope my book is is contributing to. Your your book back in 16 um, that, that touched on, that really kind of began to open up the door on this conversation, evicted poverty and profit in the American city, won the Pulitzer Prize for general um, uh, nonfiction, and changed the conversation a bit, I think people would say. Tell us how that, what what the thrust of uh, evicted was, and, and bring it forward to uh, your latest work, Poverty by America, uh, and and the change you think you can we all can potentially see, starting with this idea of being uh, poverty abolitionists. I, I like that concept. Um, but you know, you see what I'm trying to see how how you started the conversation in sixteen around the the poverty and profit uh, motives that that exist uh, in the eviction in, in home ownership eviction and in all of that to what we see today. Yeah. Evicted was a work of bearing witness. So I moved into Milwaukee uh, Mobile Home Park. I moved into a rooming house in the inner city and spent time with families getting evicted. Went everywhere with those families and saw a level of poverty that I had never seen before. You know, I met grandmas living without heat in, in Milwaukee. I, um, I saw uh, kids evicted like daily. You know, I, I remember seeing this eviction of a home uh that just kids were living in, you know, mom, the mom had died and the kids had just gone on living and sheriff threw their stuff on the curb. Someone called social service, the landlord drilled a new lock and we were off to the next eviction. And I think that really provoked in me this question of why, why, 
you know, why so much hardship in this land of dollars? And I think that to answer that question, you got to write a different kind of book, mm -hmm. you know, you got to expand the aperture. And so there's this line by the novelist, Tommy Orange, uh, where he writes, it's like these kids are jumping out of the windows of burning buildings, falling to their deaths. And we think that the problem is that they're jumping. Mm. And mm. when I read that, I was like, man, that sounds like the poverty debate. Yeah. So this book is about the fire. You know, it's about who lit it and who's warming their hands by it. What don't people get about poverty? That we have to, that it can end, that it can end, that we don't have to live with it. You know, that we can, like, that, that the ideal poverty rate is zero. And I think that for some of us, that sounds Pollyannish, that sounds pie in the sky. It does. But, and, and so, but, so it does. But, but why? Yeah. Why? I mean, stop and yeah. think about what we're saying here, that the idea that I'm looking at, I drive through a neighborhood. Mm. Oh, hell. Or even in my own neighborhood, because two blocks around the way, you know, there's some folks who are having having some struggles. Right. So everyone kind of thinks yeah. it's somewhere else when really it's right next to you. Um, yeah. And ironically, Matt, even some people who are themselves right at that line or just over that line don't see themselves that way. What is is it this whole American dream a landscape that we've sort of created this illusion uh, that you know everybody can have the American story that you know the rags to riches phenomenon, but we're talking about generational poverty here. I mean, mm -hmm. before we even get into race and racism, we're just talking about po people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what is it that we don't see about others? Is it that we don't see ourselves in them? I think we do. And I think that's why we often grab hold of these myths so much. These myths that I can work my way out of it. I can be safe. Like I'm not going to, they, they, they had a failing. I will not have that failing. And right, I think right. that we don't believe that, but it's comforting, right? Because in the land of the free, we could ascend to very high places, but we could also fall to very great depths. And I think that's terrifying, especially those of us who are parents. It's terrifying for our kids, which is why we just try to dump as much, you know, uh, into them as, as possible. And so I think, though, something's shifting in the country. I think something's changing. And so most Democrats and most Republicans now uh, feel that uh, poverty is caused by unfair circumstances, you know, not a moral mm -hmm. failing. It's different. Uh, most Democrats and most Republicans now believe that the federal minimum wage should be higher, that the rich aren't paying their taxes. And so I feel like the old is dying, but the new hasn't been fully reborn yet. I feel like the country is striving and yearning for a different language of all this inequality. Yeah, I I, mm. I don't know. I don't know, man, if I if I'm with you on that one. I don't I don't yeah. know if I don't know if I'm fully there. There, there is that aspirational aspect of this conversation that I, I, I really gravitate towards and, and want to put a hook in. But then I look at the human condition and, and, and all the things that kind of feed off of that condition that don't improve it, but make it worse. And so the us versus them story seems to be the new American narrative, mm -hmm. where there are more people inclined to see other than see themselves reflected. And it's not just the there but for the grace of God go I, but the fact that I have family members, I have friends, I have people I know in this situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I still, I still kind of, and, and, and I don't, I, I really kind of wall them off. Hmm. I kind of wall them off. And, you know, my, my social commitment with the air quotes around social commitment is, oh, I wrote a check or, or I gave a guy who's standing out in front of McDonald's, you know, some pocket change or even took him inside and got him a happy meal, you know? And I can tell you from the work that we're doing, for example, uh, at Catholic Charities, 
it is about the whole person. It has to be about the whole person because it's not just the fact that they need a hamburger at the moment, but they need a dentist, they need a uh, shelter, they need, you know, an education. They, they, there are all these other pieces that feed the poverty story. Mm -hmm. And my question, I guess, is, or concern, is why, I mean, why I'm not, it's like, yay, <laughs> what you just said is, those other elements aren't necessary. I mean, you're you're trying to draw our attention to it because that's part of being an abolitionist. You've got to see, <laughs> you know, the, going back and looking at the abolitionist movement uh, in in the 1860s, 50s, and 60s. It wasn't just about ending slavery. It's like, okay, once you do that, then what? Right. You know, 40 acres and a mule, right. civil. You know, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, voting rights, all these other pieces that were part and parcel of the, the, the slave culture. The same is true here in, part, in poverty. What are those, how are those other pieces in your view getting addressed as well? Right. I think that one of the things we can ask ourselves is, you know, why do we give? Why do we do that happy meal, right? Why do we right. drop change in someone's cup? And I think that part of the answer is because we feel complicit, you know, and I think that what I'm striving for isn't just the end of poverty. It's a better country. Like right. I ran across this quote, my wife sent me this today. It's by a book called The Wisdom of the Sands. Mm -hmm. And it goes like this. If you want to build a ship, don't gather people together to collect wood and don't assign task and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And I feel like a country that ends poverty is a safer country. It's a happier country. It's a freer country. It's you and me um, going out to eat and knowing that everyone in that restaurant is taken care of. It's, it's the parents knowing that whatever their kids lot in life, they're going to be protected from this degrading, you know, indignified poverty that we, we tolerate. So I think that right now the only game in town is try to get as high on the ladder as you can. Right, right. But I think that the country wants a different game, and I think the country is longing for, um, longing for something different, including those of us that are very privileged. And and um, and the end of poverty, of course, would mean a whole different existence for those who are below the line. Well, so, an end to poverty threatens the system, is what I would argue. But it doesn't have to. Well, that, well, yeah, okay. So then that's that's the corner we got to turn. Yeah. Because you got to tell a whole lot of folks out there that giving that brother and that sister over there an opportunity to actually play the game and engage and 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 realize the American dream that everyone promises is available to them will require something that they have to they don't want to give up, and that's a little bit of power a little bit of economy and it's not not a zero sum narrative that's the problem a lot of people see this as zero sum if matt is better i'm worse right i'm worse off if that happens and and my argument has always been no if matt is better good for matt but i'm hoping that matt also recognizes that he can contribute to expanding that opportunity as well it's not just what the government can do. And this is what you this is what you write about in terms of when you said that if the top 1% of income earners just paid the taxes they owed, right? Just pay what you owe, baby. This is this is what you made. This is the tax, pay it. The country would raise an additional $175 billion. So it's not just it's not just what these government programs can do, but it's also what we can do. Right. Which is what I love about your your wife's sharing of that quote, mm -hmm. because it's something I remember telling Jack Kemp, um, who always used to talk a great deal about a rising tide lifting all boats, right? And one of the last events I did with Jack of, of, of great memory um, was at the end of that evening, it was at someone's home in, in here in the, in the capital region. And we were walking out the door and we were talking 
And I just said to him, I said, you know, I've listened to you and I've been an acolyte of a lot of what you said. But I said, one of the things that I've, I've come to realize after I leave these conversations is that you're absolutely right. A rising tide lifts all boats, but you got to have a boat first. Right? So when that tide of opportunity and prosperity and good times comes, you can rise with it and not be drowned because of it. Yeah. And and that's where I that's where I take the poverty conversation is how do we as citizens and as institutions make sure that everyone has a boat? And we're all better off when everyone has a boat. And now we're all better yeah. off when everyone because I'm not I'm not I'm not judging you. You got a dinghy, baby. You got a boat, <laughs> right? I'm not going to judge the size of your boat. The the thing is, you you're in play. You're in the game, right? That's right. And I think the reason why I want to be pragmatic about what we could accomplish is, you know, is I guess what I'm. I, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say like we both agree that the inclusion of the poor into the union is a benefit to the union itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think there's a way to do that. That's completely tangibly within our grasp. Mm -hmm. You know, it means making deeper investments in ending poverty investments paid for by fair and sensible tax enforcement. It means those of us that are in the top 20% taking less from the government than we mm -hmm. do. And that's not redistribution. That's a rebalancing of the safety net. You know, that's making investments to the families that need it the, the, the most, not the families that need it the least. And it's finally turning away from segregation and opening up our communities to broad prosperity. On one hand, those are radical changes, right? right, right. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean we have to have a completely different society or usher in a socialist revolution or everything turns upside down. The end of poverty also doesn't fix everything, yeah. right? I mean, there's still a lot of inequality in a land without poverty. There's still racism and misogyny in a land without poverty. But a land without poverty is just a better place to live, I think, for all of us. I agree with all of that. And 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 I think for me, you know, as, as somewhat of a political tactician, I kind of look at it and go, okay, how tactically, how do we accomplish this given given some of the the realities that we know? And I think my biggest takeaway now, and, and, and I know I wouldn't let you get onto your next thing and and, and wrap up the conversation with the, this final thought from you, at least from what I'm taking away from our conversation and what you've written in Poverty uh, by America is we have we have the ability within ourselves to begin to change the nature of this conversation. It really begins with how we reimagine uh, poverty, not as something, oh, those poor people, mm. but as something in which we all have a stake in the outcome. Right. Right. I mean, so how, how, right. it, yeah. how is that? Yeah. How, is that how you would sum up? Uh, and what's your takeaway you want folks who are reading this book, and I highly recommend folks, uh, please pick up a copy of Poverty by America. It's out now. Uh, but how? what's your takeaway you want people to have when they, when they, you know, get beyond the statistics and the math and the numbers and all that, the, the human piece? Because that's what I got from it was, that's why I sort of latched on to this, this abolitionist thought, because it's, mm -hmm. it's such a, it's such an important strategy in how we begin to talk about this thing. Yeah. I think that we have to start taking responsibility for this in our own lives. And I'm very wary of any absolving theories of poverty. Right. You know, we can't put it on Congress. We can't put it on the richer guy. We can't put it on the, the shoulders of the poor. My God. I think we need to start taking some ownership over it and asking ourselves, like, what is our political party, our elected representatives? What are our churches and our mosques and our synagogues? What are our schools doing to divest from poverty? And we can join movements. I mean, there's all sorts of incredible movements going on that are fighting poverty right now. So one thing that I've done is create a website called endpovertyusa.org, mm -hmm. endpovertyusa.org. 
And listeners can go there and just look at groups that are fighting this fight on the ground right now and get involved, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also it's just fun and meaningful. Right. Right. And, and, you know, if you, if you're longing for community and warmth and big heartedness, I highly recommend joining an anti-poverty movement. Well, I, I appreciate uh, your raising uh, this conversation uh, in, in such a way that grabs not just the attention, but the imagination of how we can begin to deal with this uh, subject um, and recognize the human being behind the statistics the families behind uh, the, you know, the the dark stories uh, and recognize that we can all become poverty abolitionists in our own way to begin to push ourselves and our communities and our country in a direction that a generation from now, we're not talking about uh, the number of kids in poverty. We're proud of the number who aren't. Uh, right. and, I think, and I think that that's I, I think that's a, a great effort. Uh, Matthew Desmond, uh, really appreciate you taking time man, to bring our attention to uh, your latest work. Poverty by America is out now. His earlier work, uh, which really began to change uh, the way we talk about this and, and think about it, evicted poverty and po profit in the American city. Um, pick up a copy of both their, their compendiums on, on the subject, I, I would say, uh, and, and really kind of um, begin to reimagine and appreciate what we can do um, to help our neighbor and, and our families uh, that, uh, that are stricken by poverty. Uh, appreciate you, brother, very much. Thank you, Michael. Just really enjoyed this conversation. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, folks, that sort of wraps us for this week. I love it when you take a moment with us and, and get to share in the conversation with very, very smart, capable people out there doing some wonderful stuff uh, to help all of us uh, improve our quality of lives in communities like Matthew. Again, check out his work, Poverty by America. Uh, Matthew, that, that uh, website again for the other program where they can just go and get some information. EndPovertyUSA.org. EndPovertyUSA.org. Check it out as well. Um, until next time, folks, you know, take care of yourselves out there. Spring is here. You're beginning to see the flowers kind of, although the temperature dropped to freezing last night. So I, I, got, I got to have a conversation with Mother Nature. But in the meantime, let's get ready for spring. Um, and uh, until next time, be safe and be well. Don't forget to do the downloads. We love it when you do it. Uh, follow um, Matt uh, on Twitter at just underscore shelter um, and follow me on Twitter at Michael Steele uh, and the podcast at Steele underscore podcast. Until next time, take care. <laughs>